Hey everybody, it's Julian. You're never too old for bedtime stories. Tonight we're reading chapter two of My Friend Flicka by Mary O'Hara. Nell McLaughlin pulled the drop leaf cherry table out from the corner, opened the leaves so that it would comfortably accommodate four people, and flung a red check cloth over it. The roomy kitchen was full of bright sunshine from the windows, which opened on the front terrace. It made squares of gold on the painted apple green floor, and in front of the sink and stove and the baking table, there were hooked oval rugs with gay flower patterns. A little brown cat sat by the stove washing her face. Neither motherhood nor the hard living at the ranch had deprived Nell of her figure or her maidenliness. At 37, she looked not much older than when she had won a silver cup at Bryn Mawr, her best all-around athlete of her class. Of medium height, with a long slender waist, her curves were held where they belonged by trained muscles. And, as she walked, there was a lightness about her which came partly from natural vigor and partly from the way her narrow head lifted from the shoulders to face whatever was uh, to be faced, a danger, a storm, a loved one, a hope, or a fear. Her skin was tanned to a light fawn color not dry and weather-beaten, but smooth with a luster that came of persistent care, and the thin lips of her rather wide mouth, with clear-cut, sensitive curves, were only faintly pink. Her satiny hair, of the same soft fawn color, fell in a bang over her forehead. The rest was just long enough to be brushed back in a shining smoothness and fastened into a little bun in her neck, by her neck. Riding, she often pulled out the few pins that held it, and let it go wild in the wind. And then, with her pale forehead and her dark blue eyes, with their wild, free look, hers was the face from which Ken's had been copied. Ken was late for breakfast. Coming in, he looked first at his father to see if he had opened the report cards. Then he said, Good morning, Mother. Good morning, Dad. Pulled out the one empty chair, a green-painted ladder-back chair with a seat woven of rawhide thongs and sat down. His heart was beating hard because his father's face had its glaring look and Howard was smug. Howard always got good marks. The two boys looked at each other across the table. Howard was considered the handsomer one of the two. His hair was black like their father's with a meticulous center part and the straight lines of mouth and brows and the bold, somewhat arrogant carriage of his head made him seem formed and already possessed of a definite character. Whereas Ken was unformed, his face sometimes falling into lines of poetic wistfulness and beauty, sometimes like a thing accidentally assembled of doubtful promise. Ken was afraid to look at his father. His blazing blue eyes were hard to meet. They glared at you out of the long, dark face with its jutting chin. Often Ken felt his own eyes reeling back from an encounter, and he would turn away or look down. McLaughlin picked up a card and a letter which was lying open beside his place. I suppose it will come as no surprise to you to hear that you have not been promoted, he said. You might like to see your marks. He tossed the card over to Ken. Now McLaughlin handed Ken a blue bowl full of oatmeal covered with cream and brown sugar and said, Better eat breakfast first. But Ken took the card and tried to focus his eyes upon it. He hated so to look. It was hard to see anything at all. While he studied it, there was a silence. Howard eating his bacon and smiling. Nell's face was troubled. She looked down, buttering her toast. Ken read his marks through and finally came to the English examination. He looked up and met his father's eye. McLaughlin leaned forward. Just as a matter of curiosity, he said, how do you go about it to get a zero in an examination? Forty in history, seventeen in arithmetic, but a zero? <clears throat> Just as one man to another. What goes through your head? Yes. Tell us how you do it, Ken, chirped Howard. Nell shot a swift look at her older son. You eat your breakfast, Howard, she snapped. Ken had no answer. His face burned, 
and he bent over his plate and began on his oatmeal. McLaughlin pushed away his plate and took out his pipe. There was a silence while he filled it and lit it. Then he picked up the letter and read aloud. My dear Captain McLaughlin, it is with regret that I must tell you that Kenneth's examination marks, averaged with his daily work, do not bring his grades up to passing mark. This is particularly disappointing as his failure is due to carelessness and inattention rather than to lack of ability. If he had done even a fair amount of work consistently throughout the school year, he would have been promoted into the sixth grade. As it is, he will have to repeat the fifth. With kind regards to Mrs. McLaughlin and yourself, very sincerely, Leonard Gibson. McLaughlin put down the letter and looked across the table at Ken, then at his pipe, which had gone out. Fortunately, he said, reaching for a match, there are almost two and a half months before school begins again. You'll do an hour a day in your lessons all through the summer to make up this work. Mel McLaughlin saw Ken wince as if something had actually hurt him, and his eyes went to the wide open window with a despairing look. Well, McLaughlin said, his voice like a crack of a whip, speak up. What have you got to say for yourself? I, I don't know, answered Ken. What were you doing in that English exam? What were the questions you missed? We were supposed to write a composition. What did you write? I didn't get started. Didn't write a word? Ken shook his head. Couldn't you think of anything? <coughs> yes, I had it all planned. I was going to write the story about how you lost your polo mare, how the albinos stole her from Banner. Ken's eyes went to his father's. We could write anything we wanted. It had to be at least two pages. Well, what happened to you? I, I got to thinking about it, thinking about Gypsy and the albino, what it was like when he took her away, where he took her to, and all those wild horses in this band, and where they were all that time, all of that. I thought there was time. I, I thought the hour had just begun, and, and, and then the bell rang. And you never even started? Howard said. He was looking out the window the whole time. I saw him. Tears were crowding at the back of Ken's eyes. He wished his father would stop looking at him. There was a knock at the back of the door, and McLaughlin shouted, Come in! Gus, the Swedish foreman, came in, carrying his big felt hat in his hand. His thick-set body bent in a sort of bow aimed respectfully at Nell, and he looked first of all at her as he said, Good morning, missus. And then, good morning, boss. He did not come clear into the room, but propped himself by a hand on the door jamb, leaning there in his shy manner, a little smile like a child's turning up the corner of his mouth. His brown pink face was framed in a mop of tight gray curls. What's the day, boss? Ken and Howard stopped eating to listen. Only Gus, or perhaps their mother, could ask their father his plans and get an answer. When they asked him, he just said, wait and see, or perhaps he would not answer at all. And as every day of the summer was packed with events such as thrilling as a circus, they lived much of the time in such suspense that they were ready to burst, dogging their father's steps, trying to be every place at once so as to be sure not to miss anything. Weather always entered into the plans, so before McLaughlin answered, he glanced out the window noting the clear blue, deep blue of the sky, and that the big white cumulus clouds were sailing across at a rapid pace. There's a high wind in the pines, said Nell. Heard it first thing this morning, like surf, a roaring. And the windmill's going lickety split, said Howard. Clear for today and maybe tomorrow, said Gus, but a big cloud bank is in the sud-west. Storm cooking up. McLaughlin sat in thought and puffed at his pipe, not at all embarrassed by the fact that four pairs of eyes were watching him and four people waiting for his words. Finally, he said, as if to himself, not looking at Gus, a good, a good day to move the horses. Draw, boss, it's time the horses were off the meadows. The grass is growing and we should have the water on them soon. Howard couldn't keep still. Could I help you move him this year, Dad? Ken didn't ask because... He had no hope. 
McLaughlin turned to look at Howard, but he wasn't thinking of him and did not answer. He smoked and Gus waited. At last he said, Yes, we've got a month before Frontier Days. I've got to get four of the older horses in shape to rent to the rodeo. That means foolproof. And those three-year-olds will have to be broken. I can't let them go any longer. You're not going to break them yourself, Rob, said Nell in an alarmed voice. Her husband didn't answer. You promised last year, exclaimed Nell. It's my own fault for letting him go so long. It's not your fault or anyone's. You haven't time. You haven't help enough to take care of twenty horses, let alone a hundred. Well, I can't let them go any longer. You shan't do it. The dark blue of Nell's eyes turned almost black with the widening of her pupils. What, Nell? I can't stand it. Her smooth brown face flushed. You fighting the horse, and the horse fighting you. Yells and falls and dust and sweat. It makes me sick to see you. Gus suggested. There's sure to be some good bronco busters in town about this time, waiting for the rodeo. McLaughlin frowned. No bronco busters going to break my horses. But Rob! His voice rose. It ruins a horse! He was shouting. This was one of his pet tirades. He loses something and never gets it back. Something goes out of him. He's not the whole horse anymore. I hate the method. Waiting until a horse is full grown, all his habits form and then a battle to the death, and the horse marked with fear and distrust, his disposition damaged. He'll never have confidence in a man again, and if I lose the confidence of my horses. But they're only three years old, persisted Nell. Howard and Ken looked at her in astonishment. There was a soft look about her fawn-colored hair and smooth, unlined face, but nothing soft about the determined look with which she looked, faced her husband. How could she be so fearless in the face of their father's anger and shouting. Besides, she said, they have been handled a little. Remember, it's not as if they were Bronx that you've just been pulled in off the range. McLaughlin sat for a moment or two without reply. Then he turned to Gus. All right, Gus. Can I help them move, you, move them, Dad? Said Howard again. No, roared McLaughlin. It's tough enough for one man to move a hundred horses. Half of them Bronx or loco. All of them fresh as hell after a winter out, without a kid along to be popping his head up somewhere just the moment to stampede the bunch. Couldn't I even open the gates for you going down? said How Howard, crestfallen at the thought of missing the long day's riding, the close inspection of all the new spring colts, the exciting trip up the summer range on number 20 with Banner, the big stud, and his big band of broodmares. His father ignored the question and turned back to Gus. You and Tim had better spend the day on the irrigation ditches then. They'll have to be in shape before we turn the water on in the meadows. Job us! And catch up Shorty and saddle him up for me. I'll be up at the stables in a half hour or less. Job us! Gus went out. McLaughlin put down his pipe and pulled his coffee cup towards him. There was a moment's silence, and then Howard asked Ken, What horse did you ride this morning, Ken? Cigarette? McLaughlin looked up. You been riding cigarette? Yes, sir. Did you manage to catch her and tie her up without breaking anything? No, sir. What did she break? A bridle? No, that is, not today. She broke a bridle yesterday. What did she break today? The middle catch on the halter rope. Haven't I told you that you can't tie that mare with one of those? That you have to put a lariat on her? Yes, sir. Well, why didn't you? I thought, I thought... Ken's voice failed him. There weren't any words. He gulped his milk. You thought? Trouble is, you don't think. McLaughlin's voice was gentler. Howard spoke again. Did you find the saddle blanket, Ken? What saddle blanket? asked McLaughlin, on alert again. I lost a saddle blanket out on the range yesterday afternoon when we were riding, said Ken. Oh, you did, his father was sarcastic again. Rode with a saddle, I suppose, and didn't cinch it properly? Yes, sir, said Ken doggedly. But I found it this morning. There was a quiver in his voice. Anything the matter with it? snapped like McLaughlin. Ken was desperate. Well, it got a tear. It got caught on barbed wire. 
McLaughlin roared. What am I going to do with you? You're the doggondest kid for losing and busting and forgetting. Ken stared at his plate and felt the heat rising in his face, and a lump choked his throat. Dad, if I only had a colt, what's that got to do with it? Howard's got a colt. He was only nine when you gave him high boy, and he trained him. I'm ten, and even if you give me a colt now, I couldn't catch up with Howard because I can't ride it till I was a, it was a three-year-old, and then I'd be thirteen. Nell laughed. Nothing wrong with that arithmetic, but McLaughlin answered. Howard never gets less than 75 average at school, and he pays attention to what I tell him, and doesn't lose equipment, or break it, or get it spoiled somehow. Ken had no answer to any of this, but kept his eyes down. Did cigarette toss you? asked Howard cheerfully. Yes, answered Ken. Did you clap your heels into her? demanded his father. Yes, sir, said Ken automatically. Did you rub her down? Nothing for it. It was all going to come out. He turned to his father drearily. I, no, sir, she got away from me. Got away from you? Where? Just at the county road gate. I was closing it, coming into the stable pasture. How did it happen? Well, I had the rein in my hand, and I was standing there. What for? Nothing. I was just looking around, looking back at the range. And after a little while, she wanted to graze, and she just gave a little jerk. And she was loose, and then she knew it, and I couldn't catch her. She ran away. Ken felt he might as well tell it all and be done with it. And she got her foot in the rain and broke it. Thought you said you didn't break a bridle today. Ken hedged. Well, it wasn't exactly the bridle. It was the rain. His father unexpectedly made no comment, but looked thoughtfully at Ken. What were you thinking of when you were standing out there by the gate, just standing? My colt. Your colt? You haven't got a colt. The colt I've got in my mind, explained Ken. Oh, so you've got one in your mind? Yes, sir. Well, you better keep it there where it won't run away. Howard laughed loudly, and McLaughlin knocked the ashes out of his pipe, stuck it in the pocket of his leather vest, and got to his feet. Ken said desperately, Won't you give me a colt, Dad? McLaughlin paused a moment and looked down at his small son. You're going to have to buck up, Ken. I don't know what to do with you. You never have your wits about you. Always wool gathering. You lose a saddle blanket the first time you go riding. But I found it again. Yes, found the blanket and lost your horse. Trouble is, you don't try. I do try. I'd like to see some proof of it. Come, Howard. You can ride with me as far as the meadows and open the gate. Ken pushed the chair back too. Can't I help? Certainly not. You have your studying to do. Every morning, right after breakfast. Remember that. McLaughlin's scarred boots and heavy spurs clattered across the kitchen floor. Howard strove after, nobly refraining from casting a patronizing glance at Ken. Nell got her apron and tied it over a short blue and white striped dress. Her bare legs had a smooth coat of sunburn, and her small bony feet were neatly shod in brown Mexican harachas. Ken stood in a daze, looking at the door that had closed behind his father and Howard. He felt his mother's hand on his head. She moved it gently, straightening his part. Kenny, she said, you can ride any horse on the ranch. Why are you so set on having a colt? Oh, mother, it isn't just the riding. I want a colt to be friends with me. I want him to be mine, all my own, mother. As she looked down into his upturned face, her heart misgave her with the passion and intensity of his longing. But she understood. Yes, she too was like that, all my own. And she turned away and began to clear the table. Nell's cat was mewing beside her, begging. No, Polly, this is for the dogs. Nell had some scraps and cornmeal mush on the big plate. She handed it to Ken. Take it out and feed the dogs, Ken. Chaps, a fat, curly black cocker, his long, hairy chaps on his front legs, was out there, drooling with eagerness. The yellow collie, with the white ruff around his neck, and the sad brown eyes, stood to one side 
polite and patient, waving his brush of a tail as he looked at Ken. Ken put down the plate and went slowly back into the kitchen. His mother was bustling about. She put a plate of food near the stove for Polly, whipped the cover off the table and shook it, let down the drop leaves, and pushed the table over into the corner of the room by the window. She picked up the little bright oval rugs. Here, Ken, you might as well take these out and shake them for me. She went to the sink and ran hot water into the dishpan. Standing there, she could look out the door and watch him, shaking the rugs slowly, making a game of it, trying to scare the dogs. And it took her back to when she was a little girl and her mother had made her shake the rugs out of doors after breakfast. That was at the Cape Cod Cottage, where it had begun to be too hot to stay in Boston. The water filled the dishpan. She used to shake them very slowly, one by one, looking around, sniffing the salt tang in the air, listening to the soft boom of the breakers on the beach, until her mother's voice inside would call her to hurry with those rugs. The hot water was running over and burning her hands. Hurry with those rugs, Ken. He brought them in. If I could have a colt, he said, like an automaton. You go up and do your study now, Ken, and get it over with. Where will I put the rugs? Lay them on the chair. I have to sweep the floor yet. Ken obeyed and walked reluctantly to the door of the dining room. Where will I study? Where are your school books? On the shelf of my room. He went out the door, and she could hear his steps dragging up the stairs. She sighed. Now, all summer, it'll be the cold, she thought. I wish Howard wouldn't tease him so much. No use speaking to Rob about it. He upholds him, says Ken has to take it. I'd make Howard shut up. Wish Rob would give him a colt. She dried the dishes rapidly and put them away. There was no kindling, and she ran out to the woodpile behind the house, seized the hatchet, swinging it as lustily as if it had been a racket on a tennis court. It's a good thing Gus isn't around, she thought. The other day Gus had caught her cutting wood and had gently taken the axe from her hand. Three men on the place and you cut your own wood, missus. No, not while old Gus is here. It had amused Nell at first to be addressed as the missus, but it had not taken her long to learn that, here in the West, it meant the woman, with all the words signif signified of gentleness and motherliness. Here, in her world of men, husbands and sons, hired men, hang crews, horse buyers, to be the missus meant that before the, uh, which they could remove their hats and bend their heads. In the cities, a woman could turn into a driving machine or harden herself to meet difficulties, but the missus on a farm or a ranch, though she might be the milker of cows or a trainer of horses, must be more and not less woman for all that or she would rob the men around her of something which was as sweet to them as the sugar in their coffee. She carried in her kindling, filled the basket beside the stove, and took up the broom. Through the window she caught sight of a great tumbleweed bounding across the green, and stood still, watching, her lips parted, and her eyes alight. She heard the jack pines roaring like surf. She thought, yes, like the sea, she could see them bending and swaying in the wind. It was a day when she wanted to be outdoors, riding on the range, where the wind would whip her hair and drive her the way it drove the tumbleweed across the green. But first, sweeping, bed-making, cleaning, the new dinner, she began to sweep, singing. Oh, the ship she sailed across the sea. Goodbye, my lover, goodbye. We'll read another chapter tomorrow night. Good night.